Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today uh, for this men's conference. We do this once a year and uh, really appreciate all of you have taken the time to uh, come to this year's men's conference. Uh, today, um, we are going to have a lot of discussions happening. So uh, I just like to request if we could, you know, have, make sure our tables have at least five people uh, or one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. So if you could just rearrange ourselves, make sure that every table has at least five people there so that uh, we, we are going to be uh, having a, a bit of discussion. So if you are in a table that has only two people, uh, just move across to another table that uh, has a vacant seat. Uh, so we can just re rearrange, rearrange ourselves quickly. Uh, just make sure that your table has at least five so that uh, we can have uh, meaningful conversations, discussions. Um, and uh, Anand, I think you need a table with some people there. <laughs> Go on. Okay, uh, yeah, just, just, just rearrange yourselves wherever you can. Okay, and uh, welcome to, to those of you who are uh, uh, connected with us on Zoom. Uh, we hope that you also will have a very meaningful uh, day today. And uh, uh, you will also be able to discuss in the breakout rooms that, that will happen uh, during the session. So we'll, we'll, make, we'll facilitate that the breakout rooms will happen. Okay, so... The, uh, we have four sessions today. If you just look at the schedule, I think you'd see that on your page too. Uh, the plan for today, we have four sessions. Uh, each session will be about one hour, but the way we're going to do it is there'll be t 30 minutes of teaching where I'll just share, uh, focus, uh, give us some direction on what we're going to think about, feed on. And then we're going to have 30 minutes of discussions where we really want... Uh, us to exchange and interact. And so you're going to get to know people at your table well. Uh, you're going to be able to share your own experiences, your own learnings with others. And so we want to have, that's how each, each hour, each session uh, will take place. We'll have um, a tea break, lunch, and so on. And then uh, every session will end with prayer so that whatever we talk, discuss, and learn, we can uh, engage in prayer together on. Okay, so let me just introduce what we are going to cover today. The entire, uh, the, the, the title of the conference, Real Man, and a lot of the content is actually taken from a book by the same name, Real Man. And this, you can see this on page one, uh, by Edwin Cole. Now, just to give us a little background, some of us, you know, uh, at least for my own self, I, I, I like to read history. I like church history. Uh, I like to know what God has done in the past it's, and always be inspired by that. And so if you look back at the recent decades on how God has been speaking very specifically to men in the church. And that's very interesting. Uh, Edwin Lewis Cole was uh, a minister. Uh, he, he, he spent several years, decades in, in ministry, pastoring a church and so on. But somewhere in the 1970s, God began to stir his heart to really focus on ministering to men. And so in 1977, he quit his church and church ministry, pastoral ministry, and he launched a ministry that was dedicated to men. And so he's known uh, in church history as the father of the men's movement. So he began to just focus on ministering to men. And some of, you know, his, his book, Maximized Manhood, became uh, a, a very famous book, one of the most widely read book for men globally. Uh, and so a powerful ministry took off. This was back in 1977. Uh, I did hear him speak in person during the uh, during the 90s at, at, at one point. Uh, so it was amazing uh, uh, that, that God would birth a ministry. It was like a voice to the men in the church speaking. And so that really caused the men's movement to take shape, uh, get started, and so on. And then some of you are aware that in 1990, Promise Keepers was birthed in the U.S., in the United States. Uh, it was actually uh, Bill McCartney was a football coach, and God moved on his heart, impacted his life. So he left his career as a football coach, 
focus completely on Promise Keepers, a ministry dedicated to men. And it was amazing what God did in, those, in that decade, especially in the 1990s. They would pack stadiums full of men. So imagine a weekend with 50,000 men inside a stadium and people being, you know, they're ministering God's word. It was just amazing. And the high point was, uh, I, I think it was uh, in, uh, in 1997, I think it was, when one, approximately, we don't know the exact count, but it is estimated one million men gathered together in Washington, D.C. for this, this men's gathering. And that was a high point. So God was really doing something uh, for the men in the church, awakening them, stirring them, calling them to take their role, their place uh, as men in the church, in the family, in the church, in society, in community, in the world. And so that was the men's moment that, that God started. And uh, well, when these early voices passed away, uh, somehow it seemed like, uh, you know, there's, there's been a vacuum. There seems to be uh, that, that fervor, that passion, uh, that move that was taking place seems to have died down. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, in some ways, the church has been overwhelmed by the voices in the world. And so for us today, I hope that this will be, you know, what the, the time we spend will be really a quickening and awakening for, of our call to be men in our homes, our places of work, in our families, uh, everywhere, wherever God's placed us, that we will rise up to be real men. So a lot of the content is taken from uh, Edwin Cole's book, Real Man, and if you want to buy it, you can buy it online from their website and so on. And, uh, and uh, so I just, uh, just want to make sure that that's, uh, you know, all due credit is given to to this, this prophetic voice that God had raised back in the 70s and 80s. And here we are, uh, 2023, looking at some of the things that God released through his life. And of course, I've added some of my own thoughts, and uh, there'll be scripture added as well. So what we're going to do in session one is we're going to talk about real manhood. What does manhood, what does it mean to be a real man from a biblical standard? And we want to establish that in our hearts and minds. Be absolutely clear that this is God's model. This is God's standard of being a real man. And that's who I, as a man, I'm going to model my life after. You can establish that. In session two, we're going to talk about real issues, values, priorities, and character. That, you know, this is the core of being a man. Our values, our priorities, and the character that we hold on to. That's the core. And we've got to get the core right and establish that. Then after lunch, we're going to deal with real success. So, you know, we are all in our, whatever we are pursuing, we want to be good at it. We want to win. We want to succeed. We want to accomplish. We want to do things. And after that, what? What are the real things we must be pursuing? What is real success? Right? And so we're going to bring that in and uh, talk about some of those things there. And then finally, we talk about how do we live this out uh, as a real man, uh, the, role, the roles that we are all called to play in as husband, father, friend, and a disciple of Jesus Christ. How do we live this out? So in these, uh, uh, in these talks, uh, in each of these sessions, I'll be sharing certain things, but then I also want us to discuss in our table so that you'll get a chance to share what you've learned, what, you know, many of us have been believers, have, have been disciples of Jesus for quite some time. So I'm sure you've learned certain things that you can share with others. And of course, we can learn from each other as well. So we're going to have time for interaction in each of these sessions. So let's get started with session one. Let's take a moment just to pray. And say, I want you to invite God and say, God, I want you to work in my life today. I want you to change something in me. I want you to build up something in me. I want you to do something in me. Let's pray. Let's all pray together before we get started. Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you. Here we are decades since you 
you birth this men's movement of uh, expressing your heart, calling men to rise up to their role, their call that you have for each of us in the church, in our homes, in society, in the world. And Father, today we invite your work. We invite the work of the Holy Spirit in each of us, God. We pray that by the power of your Spirit and by the power of your Word, you will tear down things that need to be torn down. That you will, Lord, uh, shake the foundations that, that, that need to be shaken. That you would rebuild and reestablish the right foundations in our lives. And God, we pray that you will build us up in, 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 in with the right kind of substance, with the, with the truth of God, with the power of the Spirit. God, that each one of us in the places where you positioned us, we will be real men. We will be men, the kind of men who will portray, who will embody Christ-likeness, Father, wherever you've placed us and what are you, whatever you've called us to do. And Father, we pray that today there will be an impartation of grace. There will be an impartation of strength. There will be an impartation that is put into our spirits that when we leave this place, we will know something has changed inside of us and that we are stronger, we are better that, uh, to go out into this world and make a difference. We invite your Holy Spirit and we commit your word, Father, as it is proclaimed, to do a mighty work in us, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. So let's talk about real manhood. I want to bring our attention as we just begin to think about real manhood. What does it mean to be a man? I want to bring our attention to the story of King Saul. And you'll read about this in 1 Samuel chapter, chapters 9, 10, 11, and so on. We, you know... Israel wanted a king. They wanted to have a king like all the other neighboring nations. So they said, you know, they told Samuel, who was a prophet and uh, said as a priest, prophet, and priest in their midst, said, we want a king. We want somebody to lead us and go take us into battle and help us fight our enemies and protect us against our enemies and so on. And so God led Samuel to choose Saul. And the Bible says, and this is in 1 Samuel 9, verse 2, that Samuel, or that Saul was a man who was more handsome, more tall, more well-built than everybody else in the land. I mean, he was, quote, a man's man, if you, if you want to look at it from an earth, from earthly perspective. But he's the man. So he was appointed king. And he had, you know, he started off well. The first two years, he did really good. He led Israel in victories and so on. But a time came into the third year or thereabouts in his, in his reign when the Philistines came against Israel. In those days, there was a constant struggle between Israel and the Philistines. They came against Israel, a big army, 30,000 plus people coming against Israel. People are afraid. They look to their king and Saul Look to Samuel. Samuel, what should I do? You're the prophet. You're the priest. Speak to me. What should I do? And Samuel said, I want you to wait in Gilgal. You wait there. I'm coming. I'm going to pray. And then you can go into battle. So wait there. And so the story, you read, this, read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Saul is in Gilgal. The people have gathered. They are waiting. The armies are out there. And they are waiting for Samuel. Samuel the prophet has given a word. Be there, I'm coming. And think about the pressure. The Bible says all the people, the Israelites, were scared. The men, they were afraid. So the king, he recognizes the people are all afraid. And they're waiting for Saul, Samuel to come. Seven days go by. That's a long time to wait. <laughs> Samuel has not come yet. And then the people get Start dispersing. They start going away. Meaning, so, uh, Saul, you're going to be the last man standing. And you have to stand alone. People are leaving. But at that moment, Saul does something that costs him his kingship. It costs him his calling. He decides saying, okay, the prophet and the priest is not coming. I'll do what he's supposed to do. And he says, bring me, the, you know, bring me the peace offering, whatever. And he steps in. He does that. And he knows he's not supposed to do that. He knows he's not supposed to 
be doing that. He does that. And as soon as he offers that sacrifice, then comes Samuel and says, why did you do it? You know. And from that moment on, it was a downward spiral for Saul. The message simply for us is, if you're the last man standing, and in the natural, you've got it all. Like Saul, he had everything. He had everything. And he was a leader. People were being discouraged. People were discouraged, and they were dispersing. They were going away. They were going to leave him alone. And he was under tremendous pressure. And, it, and if you and I are in such situations, last man standing, what would we do? How would we demonstrate that we are real men? Now translate that to our current situation in society. There's a crisis of manhood. There, is, there are people, men, who have allowed society and things around them to redefine manhood, true manhood. And we can look at it in so many different ways where, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the, the wrong, wrong directions. Some people think manhood means I join a terrorist group or I, I just do whatever I want and go the way I want. And they can have children, but you abandon children, go away, pursue whatever you want. And it's caused a fatherless generation. There is the macho male mentality I am the head of this house, so everybody else serves me. It's resulted in the hurting and the breakdown of families, uh, men brutalizing women. There's another idea or another direction that society has gone, the perversion of uh, sexuality leading to homosexuality and other lifestyles. Uh, there are all kinds of things that we are finding in and around us in society that's challenging true manhood. Feminism. They say, no, uh, we want to be equal with men, which is fine in certain places, but they're tearing down the male identity in the process. The role that man has to play is being disqualified, so to speak. Gay rights, this month is supposed to be the Gay Pride Month, and they are parading against Men or people who dare to say, I'm straight. I'm going to, uh, you know, I understand my sexuality and that's the way I'm going to live. The challenging or laughing at us. And, uh, and sometimes there is a lack of manliness and people just follow the crowd. And even media portrays manhood in so many different ways. Okay, this is real manhood. You got to be like this, or you got to be able to do this, or you got to have this. And so, all kinds of things is, is bombarding us uh, from society. And so, there's this the perceptions of manhood from society and role models that we see. Sometimes they cause confusion in the minds of people. What is man? What does it mean for me to be a man? Because all kinds of things happening around, confused. What does it mean? What is a real man? And whom should I model myself after? If I want to be a real man, whom should I follow? Do I follow what I see in the entertainment world or in the sporting world or in the business world? Or whom do I model myself as a man? Who, which voice do I listen to? In Judges chapter 9... Is, is it just an interesting story that kind of portrays what's happening in society today? You know, after Gideon, one of the judges in Israel's period of time when they had judges leading them, Gideon was a judge. And after him, his son Abimelech decided he's going to kill all the other sons of Gideon so that he could take charge. And he did that. Gideon had many sons, and Abimelech killed all of them, but one of them escaped. His name was Jotham. And you read about this in uh, Judges chapter 9, verse 1 to 15. 
So, and then Abimelech got the people to make him the next leader. And so Jotham, he uses this parable. He says, you know, people went to the olive tree and said, olive tree, you rule over us. And the olive tree said, you know, ah, why should I, you know, stop producing oil and blessing people in order to do this? So I won't take it up. Then the other trees went to the fig tree and said, fig tree, you rule over us. And the fig tree said, why should I stop producing sweet figs and get into this? I won't do that. So the trees went to the wine. They said, wine, why don't you rule over us? And the wine said, why should I stop producing this beautiful, fruitful wine which pleases men and blesses the heart, their lives? Why should I stop doing that to do this? I won't do that. And finally, they went to this lowly bramble bush that bears berries and so on. And the bramble said, okay, if you want me to be king, I want the olive, the, the fig tree, and the wine to bow down before me. Then I will be your king. And he used that parable, he used that story, that is uh, Zotham, to convey a point there. And, and it's in some way, many ways, it represents what's happening here. That what is really not strong, what is really not an expression of manhood and manliness is now being elevated to a place where all the others, true expressions of manhood are bowing down and saying, okay, we are saying okay to this. But that should not be. Amen? The olive tree, the fig tree, the wine should stand up and be who God has ordained them to be. And refuse to bow down to what is weak, what is not the substance, what's not real. And so the challenge for you and me is, is to do that in our day, in our time. So let's talk about this manhood. Uh, Quality manhood, page four. You know, so real manhood has to do with the inner man. It has to do with who you are on the inside, your moral character. The inner man is what makes the real man. So it's not the outside. And in fact, if you think about this, you know, the quality of the product depends on the quality of the material that's used. And if you use poor material, you need more shine to make it look good, to make it appealing. But if you use high quality material, you don't spend so much on the outside because the value is intrinsic. It's in the material that's used to make that product. And so people are willing to pay a lot because of what the substance is, what it's really made of. So quality is always internal. And think about these three things that influence our lives. The knowledge that we have. A man's life is limited by these three things. The knowledge of his own mind, the worth of his own character, and the principles upon which he builds his own life. What you know, who you are, and what you live by. These three things determine your life. What you know, who you are, and what you live by. They determine us. And so, who we are in private will determine our choices and decisions and the life that we live out in private, uh, in public. So, the inner person, who you really are on the inside, is so important. Private philosophy determines public performance. Charm is for an instant, but character is constant. Right? What you are on the outside, that's temporary. But who you are on the inside is enduring. That's important. So what we want to emphasize is this. That real manhood is Christ-like manhood. And that's the truth we want to live by. So let's all say this together. Real manhood is Christ-like manhood. You know, that's the standard for us. 
you know, what's happening around us, you know, all the things that we are bombarded with. No. For us, real manhood is Christ-like manhood. That's the standard. And think about the, the manhood of Jesus. Now, we know that the Lord Jesus was God who became man. We know that. We're not questioning his deity. But let's focus on his humanity, on his manhood. You know, and these scriptures we know, the, the word became flesh. And so for us to think about this, that, that God revealed himself in the manhood, the humanity, the manhood of Christ. I want us to think about that. God revealed himself to the manhood. The manliness. Jesus lived as a man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He didn't have any, he was not confused about his sexual identity. No confused. No compromise, no questioning. He came as a man. You know, page 6 it says, Philippians 2. He came in the likeness of men. He was found in the appearance as a man. And through the manliness of the manhood of this incarnate eternal word, God was revealed. And so we can say this. The perfection of manhood is seen in Jesus Christ. If you want to see what a, a perfect man is, look at Jesus. And if you look in the Gospels, you look at the life of Jesus and all of us, I'm sure we've read the Gospels. You can see different attributes, different aspects of, 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 of what a man is. And Jesus, you want to think about this, his life and ministry, he was a man's man, a man's man. And the essence of real manhood is, is seen in Jesus. You can see Jesus being gentle. Say, let the children come to me. Now, today, say, your man, children, go to mother. <laughs> but you don't see Jesus doing that. Say, let the children come to me. There is nothing unmanly in taking care of children. No, nothing. Jesus, let the children come to me. He welcomed them. He received them. He, and he put his hands on them, blessed them, prayed for them. Gentleness. Jesus was responsible for the first third, uh, early part of his life, say maybe around from 12 to about 30. He worked as a carpenter. He worked with his father. He was known by that name. Is not this Jesus the carpenter's son? In his hometown, he was first known as a carpenter by his father's trade. So he was responsible. He, he didn't shun, oh, I don't want that. Responsible. Even on the cross, he was responsible for his own mother. In that moment of agony, he tells John, John, behold, your mother, meaning take care of Mary. So there's a responsibility. He's carrying responsibility for the family, for, for his profession, for his work. He's responsible. He's not shunning responsi responsibility. He's there. You see Jesus as a man who's bold and courageous. He's courageous to stand up in the midst of people who, who were threatening his life. He could speak. He would stand up in the temple and speak even though he knew all these people were there to get him. You see him courageous in the middle of a storm. Even the other fishermen were scared. But he see courage. You see boldness right there. But then you also see his, his compassion. You know, they brought this woman caught in the act of adultery and He's extending forgiveness. He's challenging the others. He says, those of you without sin, you throw the first stone. He, he's standing by a woman 
who's caught in adultery. And he's not afraid to stand by that. And this is a man's man. Jesus would sit with the sinners and have his food. So that even the religious people say, how can this man sit with the common people, the, the, the sinners and have food? Not afraid. He was there very much in touch with, with, with everyday life. So this, and you can look at the life of Jesus. He spoke with wisdom. People said the soldiers who came to, who were sent to arrest him, they said they listened to him speak and they didn't uh, arrest him. They just went back to the uh, chief priest and they said, why didn't you bring him? They said, we never heard a man speak like this man. We never heard a man speak like this man. There's wisdom. And so you can look at, we can look at the various attributes, the expressions of virtues in the life of Jesus and say, that's the true expression of manhood in all areas. That's what a man is. Are you listening? So for you and me, when we want a model, an example, what should I be as a man? Look at Jesus. He is the true expression of manhood. Think about a scenario in the Gospels that would parallel your situation and then say, how did Jesus behave there? As a man, how did he behave there? That's the way I'm going to behave in my situation today. Because he is a true expression of manhood. I want you to think about this. In John 19 verse 5, on, this is on page 5, Pilate. Now Jesus is going through his worst time. Meaning he's been accused, spat upon, humiliated, beaten, mocked, disgraced. And he's standing before Pilate and Pilate is trying to, you know, somehow try to free him up. And Jesus doesn't say a word. And finally, Pilate brings Jesus to the people. And these words are so profound. He says these three words. Behold the man. Behold the man. And I'm trying to imagine in my mind, what angle is he coming from? Is Pilate saying, the man? Because like, hey, I can't, I can't understand this man. He's accused, he's being tormented, and, and all he's got to do is do say something to me and I can, I can release him. But he's not saying anything. What kind of a man is this? Or are you saying, I've never seen a man like this. I've never seen somebody like this. Behold the man. I don't know what Pilate was going through his mind. Like what angle? What? what this is the man. Behold the man. Now what the Bible tells us, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, 15. So just one, one sentence before that. Jesus, the only man who ever lived exactly as God had created him to live. He's the only man who lived exactly the way God created a man to live. That means he's 100% perfect. So he is the model for manhood. He is the model that you and I are going to follow. Just that's it. He's the gold standard, 100% perfect. And Ephesians 4, 13 and 15 is calling us to that same place. It says that God wants us all to come to the unity of the faith, the know, knowing the Son of God, knowing Him. Know this Jesus. Because we are called to be a perfect man, which is the full measure of the stature of Christ. So our pursuit is in knowing Jesus because we are going to become like Jesus. And he is the perfect man. He's the full measure of a man. And we are called to be like him. 
and in all things, verse 15, we are to grow up in all things to be like him. And so Dr. Ed Cole was very famous for, for the statement that he made, manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. So let's say that together. Manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous. Manhood and Christ-likeness are synonymous, right? Let's, let's let that sink in. Manhood and Christ-likeness, synonymous. And no, nobody is going to get me to compromise on that. For me to be a man, I have to be Christ-like. That's the pursuit. To grow up in all things, to be like Him. Right? So, and you can look at many aspects of the life of Jesus. He knew who He was, what He wanted, what He was called to do, what He came to accomplish. He was noble, yet humble. He was dignified, yet unassuming. He was gracious, but yet he stood up against injustice. He was tender, but he was tough. He was holy, yet he was human. He was confrontational, but yet he was compassionate. He was truthful, and yet understanding. He was filled with wisdom, and he exemplified everything. He is the epitome of real manhood. So... The main thought I want to impress on us is, to, is this. For us, our model of manhood is Christ-likeness. That's it. The world is going to, is bombarding us with so many things. And there is so much pressure for us to compromise on our, of, of, of what manhood is and should be like but for us there's one uncompromising statement or understanding manhood is Christ likeness that's what we're going to pursue amen he is God's expression of the perfect man and we are called to grow up in all things to be like Jesus. Amen?